Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea, and this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips that we all can do on a daily basis, which can lead us to finding our inner peace. I know that inner peace is possible. I've been without it. I've found ways to get it. And on this podcast, we talk about ways that we can find it and keep it on a daily basis. So I'm very pleased to have with us Janelle Legg as our guest. And we're going to be talking about ways that we can find our own success, find our own inner peace uh, as we work through just finding it from within, that this is something that we already have, we just may not recognize that we have it. And that's why I'm very pleased that Janelle is with us to help to explain how it is that we can discover what's inside of us and and actually get that to the outside of us. So thank you very much, Janelle, for taking the time to be with us. Thanks, Chris. Uh, So if you can tell us a bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Sure. I'm a leadership executive coach and also a psychotherapist so i've been in the personal transformation space for over 20 years now and it's an area of absolute passion of mine i've always had a huge appetite for learning and growing and finding things that are more at the cutting edge because i've just got that kind of mind that likes to know why things work or why they don't work that really interests me as well Mm. Because I really hate seeing clients struggle with something that they're thinking everyone out there is able to use, so why can't they? And I think that really holds you back. And if you've already got sort of really negative self-talk and self-doubt, you can just go into that really negative thinking spiral, thinking that you're defective. And it can bring up a lot of shame as well. So I really like to road test stuff myself. I never give clients anything that I haven't personally Um, used myself and and found to be useful. Awesome. And and that whole, you know, approach where you've actually tried it out as you're not just speaking from theory, but from experience, I think makes a huge difference. Oh, totally. And I think that that really um, helps practitioners stand out. And because I think clients get a real sense of the authenticity behind what you're doing and what the, the truth that you're standing in. And I think they energetically very much feel that. And I think they feel safe in that. It's not like this cookie cutter, generic one size fits all. So that's, um, yeah, really key to how I work. Yeah, definitely. And people do respond to experience. And, you know, one of the things that I saw on, I think it was your website, that you talk about, you know, finding your success or, you know, your happiness, yep. that it is an inside job. And I totally. really like that phrase. Um, can you explain that? Uh, what do you mean by that? Sure. Well, I think, and I know that you've had guests in the past, I think brain science and the research and explosion of findings in that whole area now really helps us better understand how implicit or unconscious memory system works in the brain. Mm -hmm. So you can have all the right opportunities around you, all the right contacts, um, everything happening. But if you've got subconscious beliefs and programming that you're actually not even aware of, that's just your way of being in the world, then you're going to trip yourself up somewhere along the line. And there's a great book called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And he sort of talks about when we hit that upper level limit and then, you know, we can't sort of fully step into our zone of genius because we've got this subconscious programming that sort of belongs to childhood and growing up 
that's stored in memory systems when we're young. We just sort of absorb everything like a sponge. Right. And that's, what, that's why success is an inside job because if you don't sort that out, you will keep sort of hitting that glass ceiling. You'll get to a certain point and then it can be circumstantial. Oh, this happened, so that's why I can't do it. Or you're, you're getting sick all the time or headaches or backaches or migraines or, you know, life just seems to happen and, and you think it's all happening outside of you and it's got nothing to do with what's going inside your brain. Right. But when you look at, you know, saying that, so this is the stuff that we soaked up as a sponge yep. and, you know, and, and it's our unconscious or our subconscious where all this is coming from. Yeah. Does that mean that we're doomed? I mean, it, it sounds like <laughs> something totally out of my control. So like, where's no, the hope? What's the point? Uh, <laughs> no, this is where the great stuff comes in again with the advances in brain science over the years that, you know, we, the, we are totally capable of rewiring the brain. And that doesn't mean that some of the stuff in there that holds us back, we can just, you know, rub out like an eraser and it's gone. But sometimes I use the metaphor, sometimes you've just got to get in and build a bypass because Ooh. some sort of more, you know, rigid and embedded memory systems are really, really hard to sort of loosen the grip in our brain, but mm -hmm. we, the more aware we become about what's triggering us emotionally and why and behaviorally, and then we use some mindfulness techniques and self-awareness, that grip gets, you know, the white knuckle grip of those beliefs and, and habits starts to loosen and we're building in new, more functional and positive beliefs and behaviors so that then when the old system comes in to try and trip you up, we go, we sort of, it's like pressing pause on the remote control when you're watching a movie. It's like, hold on a minute. Here we go again. So we can sort of step to the side of it and then choose not to sort of slip back into old comfort zone, old behaviours. So it's, it's totally life-changing. But it, I think what everyone has to be aware of, when you think of how many years sort of maladaptive, faulty thinking or negative thinking is sort of absorbed into our brain. So that could be over, you know, a childhood or growing up. It, you can't just in a few hours totally change that. So it's consistency and practice and patience. Right. And that's where mindfulness is helpful as well because that's about not judging or beating ourselves up when negative thinking happens or we slip into old patterns. It's really developing the capacity for self-empathy. And that opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Have you found ways that can help someone with that self-empathy? Because when sure. I, I work with clients, you know, I, I think that's one of the big things that, that impedes them from moving forward. You know, they're, they're very willing to empathize with those around them. They're very yeah. willing to you know, forgive, uh, you know, the faults of loved ones. But when it comes to self, that, that's like a whole other story and a whole other set of standards. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I think to build in the capacity for self-empathy, we've got to build in the capacity for self-valuing and worthiness. And that's a lot of the work I do as a psychotherapist because the model that I've um, draw on a lot which is called the conversational model mm -hmm. that's looking at um, accumulative attacks upon value upon the self growing up and how that impacts then things like self-worth self-esteem so I find in a therapy setting and then I try and do the same type of work with my blogs and, and the tools I create for clients online is helping them identify where those attacks of value occurred and that mm -hmm. giving them a bigger context around that. And this is not about judging or blaming family or right. whoever growing up that, that doesn't take us anywhere, but it's not also prematurely jumping to the forgiveness phase either because it's got to be authentic and organic change. 
So I think the more insight and understanding that we get about certain experiences that happened to us growing up where we felt devalued, not seen, not understood, helps us to start actually empathise with that, you know, that younger child part inside of us that that was actually a, a normal human response to a very difficult situation. Right. We're not blaming anyone around it. Pete, you know, parents do the best that they can with what they got growing up. So if they didn't get empathy growing up, well, you know, you don't just magically start using empathy, do you? It's something that you learn. Exactly. So I think it's, you need a bigger sort of understanding and context. So you're no longer fused with those some subconscious implicit memory systems. It's sort of, instead of it being right up close, it's sort of more to the distance and through a conversation and you would do this in your work, Chris, as well. It's um, helping people understand the bigger context about that because the child only has the capacity to understand things at their age and we're developmentally. But now that you're an adult, you can see things through a different lens. And that's a slow, gentle process because I have have clients and you probably have as well where we've worked together for quite a while and the internal inner critic, inner judge, um, technical term interjects, are so hostile and so strong that, you know, they can't accept compliments and, yeah, they can't do self-empathy. So it's, it's a slow, gentle and sometimes tenacious process because those inner critics uh, are, can be quite relentless at times. Oh, most definitely. And, you know, I, I like how you talk about the perspective because that perspective of, of the younger child versus the perspective of, you know, an adult yeah. is going to change how we view some of that self-talk and maybe even to understand where the self-talk comes from, you know, that, yes. And and I, I would assume that in, in your work with, you know, the conversations that you can really address that well, you know, of, of you know, I, I can understand you as a child doing what you did. Yes. Yeah. So, I, um, in, yeah, the self-talk, I think, is really key because you know that that's what's constantly scripting through and until we get insights and the power of look online stuff is great and and I think it's wonderful we've got google and we can access so much information now Mm -hmm. but what I think people forget is that a huge proportion of our brain is actually wired relationally after birth So if you want to accelerate change um, and the model that I'm uh, using, the conversational model, which is backed up by studies in linguistics, brain science, trauma theory and early infant attachment, is that one of the most powerful ways to rewire our brain and change these negative scripts is to have focused, powerful conversations such as in coaching or therapy that's one of the most potent and powerful ways to shift a lot of that to try and do it on your own depends on how yeah aware you are and sure you can um, do stuff you know there's that 90 day principle of change that you can do as a self practice but if you're sort of really struggling with early the residue of early stuff that happened to you you know, you can't beat having those powerful conversations with someone that's trained to help you shift that. And, and that's a great way to, to put that, you know, when I, I'm trying to explain to people what is the point of seeing somebody else, yep. you know, and yep. I, I really like that, that you are imprinting more on the brain when you're talking about oh. their relationships. And, and even though it, it's not a, a intimate relationship in the sense of friend family, but yep. still when you're working with that counselor, it, it's a relationship and it, it does become very relational. And uh, I would assume even, you know, in, in the modeling of, uh, you know, a thought process or even a behavior. Yeah. And look, when there's that provision of safety, 
it really um, in, creates the environment for optimal brain states. Hmm. So again, that's why that powerful conversation is so powerful. And also with the model that I'm using, and this links into mindfulness, aspects of mindfulness being key to how I work, is if you're struggling to use mindfulness, because often I found with clients that were coming to me, is that mindfulness-based practices often triggered um, trauma systems and memories that were implicit systems, so outside of their awareness. But after the practice, they'd be angry or their inner critic was even worse. Right. And silence can be a trigger for that, is what I found. And I found that when you know a, a counsellor and a client is having a very focused powerful conversation your you as the counsellor practitioner or coach you're you're acting as a doubling to your client's consciousness so it's like you've got the training wheels on in the therapy space like what you put on a push bike for a kid right and with you helping them reflect and and bring into more of a an a language space and a visual space, these earlier memories, that's helping them to start to do that themselves real time because that's where they're getting stuck. And, and people used to get tripped up with old fashioned CBT style journaling and homework. And that's mm -hmm. why so many clients never did their homework because they okay. couldn't, or I've had clients that have been referred by their doctor to do an online anxiety, generalized anxiety program. And they get to about the third question, <coughs> excuse me, and they can't keep going because they can't consciously access the self-reflective insights that they need to actually use that program. Do you find that as well, Chris? Oh, definitely. The, and my training was, was more so in the CBT before I moved a lot more into mindfulness, yes. although I, I, you know, blend everything, but yeah. I would agree with you there that I give less homework than I have in the past. Um, because I, I do find that what I would have given for homework, if we discuss it in the office, it seems to be more productive than when I would have them report back to me. Well, sure. what did you discover in the homework? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is going. <laughs> Oh, no. Yeah, I think the brain science helps explain that. Just why people, they weren't trying to be naughty <laughs> or no, a repetition no. of school years where, oh, I hated my homework. They, <laughs> you know, it's parts of their brain um, that, you know, they're just not accessing. And the last thing we want for our clients is to be feeling worse. <laughs> you oh, know, we're wanting definitely. clients to feel better about themselves, not that they're failing even in therapy because they're, they're feeling like they're failing enough out there in other dimensions of their life. So we don't want to be adding to that. <laughs> oh, no, not, not at all. And, and that, that's where I find that a lot of what I'm doing is, is not only helping to guide them in, you know, finding these ways of thinking and, and processing, but yep. to be their cheerleader, you know, to, yeah. to help them to, you know, just feel good about whatever it is that they're coming up with. And uh, yeah, you know, maybe this hour with me is, is some of the only time that someone has actually said, hey, that's wonderful. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, some people will, will have actually in some way more of an intimate and I mean in terms of conversational and and being known and seen relationship that they may, may ever have with anyone else or with other people at times because particularly if they're struggling in that whole relationship space therapy can be their very first experience of actually really feeling um, genuinely seen, heard, understood. And that in itself is so powerful in terms of, you know, stepping more into that self-actualizing space where you have more agency, self-belief, more worthiness, because it's those mm -hmm. repetitive valuing experiences um, that then, you know, foster a much more robust and um, stronger sense of self and identity and that, that's, again, then success sort of starts to emerge from that. So that's the inside job part. Because until you've got that, 
again, you can have all the opportunities you like, but if you don't feel worthy and deserving, you without doubt will find ways to self-sabotage or trip yourself up along the way. And, and that for me is, is something, I, I know I've gone through that in various ways in, in life, but that, that's the, the most frustrating part for me as you know, a, a coach and a counselor is when that self-sabotaging is, is rearing its head in, yeah. in the clients because you can see that they're loving the success in what they're doing yeah. and things are going great. And then all of a sudden they hit that wall. Yeah. And, you know, everything stops and, and we're back to, I'm not worthy. I'm not, you know, all those negative talk and, yeah. you know, that, that does get frustrating because you know, what's going on, Yes. but it, it's how now do we help them to overcome those? And, and, you know, yeah. now we've got to cope with those and move on from that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So it, it does become difficult that way. Yeah, what I find when when you meet that point, because, you know, that's why people are coming to see you, because, you know, they're the very things that are happening to them. And, you know, when they're ready for change, that's exciting, because intention, as always, is key to outcome. So when that's happening with my clients, I, that's when I like to really slow things down. And that's where I help to build in better mindfulness abilities. So, for example, yeah, things are going fantastic and then all of a sudden, bang, something happens. Mm -hmm. So I sort of, you know, go, okay, let's, let's really slow that down and have a look at what was going on there. So, you know, getting them into, you know, what they were thinking, what was going on in their body, because they can start to recognise sort of common um, red flags or patterns for when they do come to that grinding halt. So um, it could be their self-judgment escalates or, you know, common trigger patterns keep happening when someone does or says something a certain way. So just really building in in the session, but they can also then start to do that more outside the session when you've got some good runs on the board. Really starting to freeze frame it, slow it down so they can start to, again, it's like you're up in the helicopter perspective of you about why is it that I get to point X and then bang, all of a sudden I stop and I, it's like snakes and ladders. I go down a few runs. Mm -hmm. So re doing lots of repetitions of that, definitely then they'll come in then in the next session and go, oh, this was happening, but I thought, no, hold on a minute, I'm doing that again. So they're actually stopping themselves real time. Sometimes yep. they'll default back into the old thing and that's okay because they're also noticing that, they're picking up on it. And then eventually they're able to just make different choices. All right, yep, I'm feeling my anxiety's escalated. I'm feeling sick or I keep getting a headache. But you know what? I think this is because I'm stepping up in my life. I'm up-leveling. So I'm actually going to keep going. I'm going to sort of do a bit of self-care, do a bit of self-nurturing, but I'm going to keep moving forward because I'm starting to understand that these are my sort of default settings for when a part of me is getting mighty fearful and scared that change is about to occur so really sort of doing lots of education and reflective work in the sessions around that right and and that is like the best thing that I love to hear is when somebody comes in yep. and talks about how they were able to stop yeah. themselves <laughs> reframe the thinking and move forward yes. I mean it's, it's like one of the best things that, that you I can hear know. I, well, to me, the proof is in the pudding. So if they're actually in real time outside the session doing what you're spending a lot of time and very carefully and attentively doing in the session, to me, you know, they're big indicators of, you know, good outcomes of, of therapy or counselling or coaching. Mm -hmm. Are they applying it real time? Is it, is it properly being integrated and wired in so it becomes a part of their being and how they do life? And yeah, that's that's what all of us practitioners want to hear from our clients. It's fantastic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, yeah, it's not to wait for me. It's no. when you start figuring it out and doing it on your own. Yes. Yeah. And then it's, it's like, so ooh, time to fly. I know. And that, that goes back to the thing you asked at the start. You know, that's why success is an inside job, because the more and more you can do that, the more you think, you know what, I'm just going to, even if it doesn't work, I'm going to have a go at that. So we'll try something new because people need to understand that, 
when we're stepping out of our comfort zone or what feels safe, it's triggering the fear parts of our brain. And that's lower, like there's a Hewlings Jackson, who was sort of the father of neuroscience, he came up with like a hierarchy of consciousness. So, you know, we've got the neocortex where we do, you know, the front part of our brain is where we do all this self-reflective and really sophisticated thinking stuff because consciousness is not just a given like self-reflecting. And then we've got the really strong primitive, you know, our lizard brain, our, you know, Mm -hmm. emotional brain. And those guys are so strong and much older evolutionary. So if you think of it like in an evolutionary model of the brain, the newest kid on the block, which is the neocortex, that is the first thing that gets compromised whenever those sort of primitive automatic parts of our brain even get a whiff of potential change because it sort of translates it as back into caveman days, Uh uh-oh, danger, warning. So, and all of this is happening so fast. We don't even know what's going on. So it it really takes work and focus to really keep, uh, uh, go back to the reflective part of my brain. I've just been hijacked here. (laughs) (laughs) Let's pause. Let's not overreact. Let's, Let's just stop for a minute, give ourselves some time and, reflect a bit about what's going on here because this is feeling a bit repetitive and familiar so even just clients understanding you know you've got the lizard part of the brain you've got the newer part that's the most vulnerable so that's the first that's compromised when there's danger trauma sort of sends sends us down the hierarchy of consciousness and I think that's a wonderful model for developing self-empathy because, hey, we've all got the same brain. <laughs> no, exactly. You know, it's yeah. not just there's something wrong with me. This is just, you know, brain science gives me a healthy model for understanding this is part of being a human being with a brain. <laughs> and mm-hmm. some people find reflection easier than others. And if I had a difficult childhood and there was, you know, trauma or stuff going down growing up, you know, a depressed parent or a parent that drank or there was divorce or, you know, sudden disruptions, you know, that impacts, you know, the natural flow of developing your sense of self and and your self image. So, you know, you've got to give yourself a break, you know, you're not Superman or Superwoman. Well, and I think that that's one of the uh, important pieces of all of this is, you know, we have to be kind to ourselves. Ah. And, you know, so often we're not kind to ourselves and, um, you know, so yeah, I appreciate you saying that because that really, you know, moves into that piece that, you know, we are who we are and yes, we're products of others, um, but be kind to yourself, you know, because we're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect and that's okay. And it's actually good. Yeah, and another technique I use with clients that is really helpful about, you mentioned earlier about that, you know, some clients just have such strong negative self-talk and can't do the self-empathy bit, is I sort of help them, and you probably do this as well, so if they've got a really strong inner critic or they're beating themselves up, is sort of going, hold on a minute, who does that voice sound like or what does that remind you of? Because often it's just an internalisation of someone from their past. So if they can, it's like giving a character to, you know, your inner critic, like the more you can do that, it sort of helps it put it a bit outside yourself. It's a bit like when you journal or write stuff, it's getting what's in there and scripting around outside of you onto a piece of paper. So visually it's, ah, there's that voice again. That sort of helps people separate from that. And that builds, opens up that space for self empathy to develop. And that makes perfect sense because once we get that, you know, self-empathy because we have an understanding of, of where things come from, yeah, it's often I'm not, not even blaming there. myself. Yeah, it's, it hasn't even originated from you. <laughs> so right. why would you be buying into it? It's something you, you've taken on board without knowing it. So yeah, yeah clients the freedom to say, hey, I actually don't need to keep telling myself that anymore. That, that's not even really how I think. That's something I've absorbed and it just doesn't serve me anymore. Right. And, and that really is a good point. It, it, it's not my voice. It, it's yeah. is someone else's. Why am I letting somebody else dictate yes. what I do? Yeah. 
yeah, very true. Um, so if people want to learn more about what you do and get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Sure. Look, I have a website, which is JanelleLegg.com. So that's dot com. I have, you know, a lot of articles and tools on that. And I'm in the process of creating some masterclass courses. So oh, I've um, got a free download for your listeners. If they just go to JanelleLegg.com forward slash success. I've got a seven success shadows um, guide download and that sort of introduces them to some of the, the concepts and practices that we've been talking about on the call today. So, well, you know, I think that's a great starting point to sort of, if you want to do further immersion in this kind of self-reflective work to do that inside job so that you're able to keep sort of moving forward to, success in the areas of life that matter the most to you because right. success for one person is not what someone else wants. So it sort of covers success in terms of a personal context and also a business context if you're in business as well. So oh, that, that's awesome. Really appreciate uh, you providing that. And in the uh, show description, I will include uh, those links. So right. that people, you know, can find that very easily and yes. uh, really appreciate that because whatever, you know, we can do to help, you know, all of us think in, in that success way and not yeah. let those voices uh, get in our way, yep. you know, I mean, not only will we be better, but, you know, the world will be better in, in the end. Exactly. That's what I love about the work. And you would see it too, Chris, is that ripple effect. So people mm -hmm. that I'm working with, especially people that really want to sort of dig in and dig deep, it's their partner's benefit, their parents benefit, their children yeah. benefit, their work colleague, like it just ripples out and no one even needs to know they're in therapy. <laughs> like oh, exactly. it's just when, when you change internally, people start to respond differently to you on the outside, your whole world, outer world changes it's that powerful. No one even knows that you're doing something, but subconsciously they're just picking up that, hey, something's a bit different here. So like you said, the whole world benefits. Yeah. And, and I do believe in that, you know, that some people have told me that's, you know, pie in the sky and whatever, but, you oh, know, no. I've seen enough dominoes, mazes to know yes. that if you hit one, they all go down in succession. Well, that's so. a systemic model approach. So you adjust just mm -hmm. one little mechanism in the system and, and the whole system adjusts. So what's that yeah, metaphor exactly. of the butterfly in the Amazon? <laughs> flap yeah, flap exactly. Flap <laughs> you know, we're, we're in systems within systems. So, yeah, I, I've seen it for over 20 years and, and similarly so have you. So I don't, you know, people that are... are, are you know, don't buy into that. That's their choice, but the evidence is definitely there. Yeah. I, I will argue that point with anyone. <laughs> um, respectfully, of course. Yes. But, uh, well, I definitely, you know, appreciate the time that you've taken to share with us and to, you know, inform us on how this really is a part of our, you know, brain system. And, you know, I, I really like, you know, what you're saying about, you know, it's not our voice. And I think if people can yeah. keep that in mind that, you know, don't listen to what's not you. Yes. And, you know, that could be a really good start to working the rest of the process. So really thank you for sharing that wisdom with us. My pleasure. I'm glad you sort of mentioned that because I think that's one of the biggest game changers. Once you really start getting on top of that, um, again, the domino effect, it, a lot of other things start to change too. Yeah. Chris, thank you very much for inviting me onto this podcast. I was very excited to do that and really appreciate the opportunity. Well, great. Well, thank you and, and have a uh, great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. And I hope that the message in this episode has inspired you and given you some of the tools that you need to find peace in your life. If you have found those tools and you found this to be inspiring and you know of others who also need these tools, please share this podcast with them. Let them know of the opportunities out there that they too can find their inner peace. Thank you very much for the sharing. 
Thank you for listening, and have a very mindful day. Thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.